All right, so welcome to the Sunday Assembly. For those of you who are not familiar with it, but I'm sure everybody is, uh, we are a secular congregation that celebrates life. We have three very easy to remember models that we truly live by, which are live better, help often, and wonder more. All righty. It's a great way to start off the morning. So life happens every day. Something happens. We haven't seen each other for about a month. Um, I'll start off with some great news in my life. I got the vaccine and I will be getting my second dose this coming Friday. Uh, so that's my good news. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. One of the advantages of uh, being Russian is that you know a lot of low people in high places. So. I will uh, open it up if anybody else would like to share. I got, uh, where's my chat? There's my chat. No. Okay, if anybody wants to raise their hand or unmute themselves, just uh, go right ahead. Okay, I can jump in a couple quick ones. I'm getting my vaccine the same day, so uh, maybe I'll see you there. And uh, so I'm very happy about that. The other thing is for everybody, happy Pi Day. Happy Pi Day. Good and I'll job. give you a Pi for and because of magic, I can give you a pie for the game. Good job, Connor. Good job. I have some exciting news. I just found out last week that I was accepted into the master's program that I applied for. Uh, so I'll be starting that in the fall for a master's of children's literature. Last week, Thursday, I uh, got the worms for my worm bin. <laughs> so it's been a week <laughs> and only 12 have died. <laughs> That's why I found out. They crawled out. So I had to figure out how to stop that, but that was pretty much, yeah. I'll probably learn exactly what I did wrong. <laughs> I was wondering what you were doing with those worms. One minute, I had the computer volume down a lot. What'd you say, Victor? What, I, are you gardening with those worms or? No, I'm using them for the vermicompost that we're learning about today. Oh, okay. Oh. You got, you got to go out and uh, buy those supplies, man. Yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, how do I get my shots? Your vaccine? Yeah. Uh, well, you can sign up with, I don't know, what you live in Royal Oak, I think, right? Or something like that. Because Oakland County Health Department, uh, CBS, Meyer. You know, it's like it's like a job application. You can't just put put in one. You got to put in a whole bunch. Yeah, I'm 49 turning on the 50 and they won't accept me. I've been rejected. Go online, get yourself a fake ID. Oh, that's what I need, a fake ID. Oh. I, st I still have mine. I I'm almost quali qualified for AARP. Wow. Yeah. They create that fake ID. Okay. Well, they said they said that, uh, I think, within, what, uh, the next three weeks, everybody over the age of 16 who, whatever, not everybody, but what, what, what do they keep saying, uh, uh, everybody who's eligible for whatever reason, so. Yeah, I didn't think we were getting ours until like July or something, but it sounds like they're trying to bring that up. Sounds like everyone, what was Biden saying? Something like the 4th of July, everyone should be able to have a party. <laughs> they, they, they said May, they said May. That's the latest I heard in the news this past week that everyone should have gotten their first shot as of May. That would be nice. Well, that, that's the people that are, who are eligible. So, you know, people with like pre-existing conditions, frontline yeah. workers. Everybody, oh, every everyone pre-existing condition or not by April 5th is eligible. That's what the governor just said. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. There's actually a service yeah. that connects you to expiring vaccine doses near you. So if like at the end of the day, there's unclaimed doses, uh, you can be put on a list to claim those. So I'll drop that in oh, the chat for everyone. Great help. Thank you very much, CJ. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, CJ. Yeah. Anybody else uh, want to brag about their life? Mm -hmm. Going, going. Okay. On. All right. Now let's have a monthly reading with Amanda Gorman.
So just mute yourself if you're not muted. When I see young women, I see the glow. In their impact, how they act, what we do and what we know, it's a kind of sheen that can't be seen in glass, diamond, or dewdrop, but the light of a wave of girls who refuse to be stopped. We don't need permission to make it our mission to make change, to be ourselves unapologetically confident, beautifully strange. We are that dawn of a billion bees. Obedience gleam, that stardust of a girl following her dreams. You can't steal the sparkle of mine. It only comes from a woman letting herself shine. It would appear we are all here, focused, fierce, without fear, each a flame dazzling and clear. Although some may doubt it, we show them. We write this poem, we dazzle, we delight, we dare, we fight, joyous, all the hustle in the spark. Join us, the wondrous warriors in the dark. Women in the world making change, we hear it and how our hearts hum it, change. We feel it and how our dreams drum it, change. Trumpets life in the impact. In fact, even with the whole world on our backs, we overcome it because women in the world don't run from it, we run it. Each of us standing on one another's shoulders. Each of us a summit. Together, together today, today, and this summit. We don't just make change, we become it. All righty. That was in honor of uh, uh, March being Women's History Month, and of course, this past Monday was March 8th, and if anybody was paying attention to last assembly, that was International Women's Day. So, happy belated International Women's Day to all the ladies here today. And speaking of ladies, on to the main event. Uh, this month, we are talking, we're going to have uh, Terry Gibb talk to us about composting, aka vermicomposting, if that's if I'm saying that right. Um, mm -hmm. So she, Ms. Gibb is a senior extension educator with Michigan State University's extension based in Macomb County, uh, but programming statewide, uh, focusing on, on natural resources and government and community vitality. Uh, she's been an extension educator for more than 30 years with a master's in teaching from Wayne State University. So let's learn all about uh, vermicomposting, how to create them, maintain them, and what they're all about. So let me turn that over. Okay, 
Hello, everyone. Um, can I share my screen? Uh, give me one second. Um, she should be able to. All participants have screen sharing options. Okay. Yep, try it out. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what do I want? This one? I think I want that one. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Go away, go away, go away. I gotta hang on. I gotta make it go where I want it to go. Uh, we are truly at the mercy of our technology. Yeah. Are you trying to go yeah, to full, it full screen? I'm trying to, but I, I, right now I've got my my Zoom my Zoom like uh, toolbar in front of it, and I can't get to it. All right, hang on a minute. Let's see if I can. The get bottom it out right, there. you could also do it as well. Um, where it was there? Yeah. Uh, right Looks here. Like, That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Try clicking that. Okay, yay, okay. Um, as you mentioned, I am Terry Gibb. I've been around, as you can tell, for a long time, um, doing this for, for a number of years. We actually started the Master Composter course in Macomb County back in 1992. And as a part of that, every year that we've done it, we have offered one session on, on worm composting. So this will be a really abbreviated version of that. So, but first I am required to give you a little bit of information about MSU Extension. Um, Michigan State University is an equal opportunity institution. Basically what that means is all of our programs and materials and resources are open to everyone without regard to any of the categories you see here listed on the screen. Uh, MSU Extension, is the informal educational outreach in and to local counties and communities. Uh, Extension is organized under federal legislation, the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. This legislation basically outlines how Extension is organized, operated, implemented, all that. Two of the things that I like to point out about this legislation are is number one, it states that Extension, the Cooperative Extension, the Cooperative Extension Service, the name's gonna depend on uh, the state. What it says it will have, Extension will have a presence in every county of every state and territory in the United States. So whether you're in Maine or Idaho or even the US Virgin Islands, if you contact your county government, you will find an Extension office. The second thing it says is that it will be a partnership between federal, state and local governments. So what that means is we receive funding and resources from uh, the federal government through the US Department of Agriculture. We are a line item separate from MSU in the state budget. And at the county or local level, we either have a memorandum of understanding or a dedicated millage that supports our educational work. Uh, Extension's mission is to help people improve their lives through an educational process that applies knowledge to critical issues, needs, and opportunities. And you see at the bottom there, the three words. When people were asked what words did they identify with Extension, proven, relevant, and life-changing were the top three choices. Proven because programs and materials and resources are research-based and proven to be the best information relevant because programming is based on the local needs and issues that are identified at the county level and life-changing due to the interaction and resources extension is able to provide to individuals, families, and communities. Okay, now how we do this, we basically are organized under four institutes and you can see the four of them there. Um, a lot of times when I ask, have you ever heard of extension before? I show up at their, at their program, and a lot of them will say no. And then if I ask them, have you ever heard of 4-H? Have you ever heard of Master Gardener? Have you ever been involved in a septic education program? 
any of these, and yes, you do know extension because we do all of that. As you can see, there are a variety of programs, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's only so much room on a slide. So, so okay, that's my little spiel. Let's get into worm composting. How many of you, you need to raise your hand or, you know, stick up, a, you know, not done in reactions. Whoops, don't do that. There we go. Um, how many of you actually already have a worm bin? That, uh, an active worm bin. You do. Okay, good, good. Okay. I, I, don't, I think somebody, the person that used this before me, put animation in this. And I don't like animation, so we're going to try to do the best we can. Um, worm composting is, is a process of using worms and other microorganisms to convert organic food waste into black, earthy-smelling, nutrient-rich humus. Okay. Okay. What are some of the advantages? It recycles food waste. So that keeps it out of landfills or the wastewater treatment plants if you have a garbage disposal. It saves energy from disposing by other means. There is no transportation cost to get it from your house to its landing point. Uh, if there's no energy costs as far as, as disposals and things like that. I am really sorry about this. Um, and it produces a rich soil amendment that benefits plants because it contains nutrients that are released slowly into, um, into the ground. And the, the red worms that we use for, for worm composting are great for fishing and can easily be grown in the worm bins. Okay, some more advantages. Um, because there should be no orders from a worm bin, it can be done indoors or outdoors. It can, you can do, do it year round as opposed to yard composting, which either slows down or stops in the winter. Um, and it allows residents with no yard that live in apartments or condos that have shared spaces uh, uh, to, to reduce the waste stream. And it's a great project that everyone, including students in the classroom, if they ever get back to the classroom, can, can do. Okay. The worms themselves, you first, let me tell you, you should not use regular earthworms that you find outside after a rain. Those do not work in a worm bin, they die. So um, the worms best suited for worm, comp worm composting are called I Icenia fetida, or red worms, or red woodworms, or tiger worms, all of those. Uh, you can find these worms at bait stores or online. If you've got a friend that's got a worm, a worm bin, you can get a cup full from them and get it started. There are so many ways. Um, these worms are very diverse in their eating habits and will eat almost anything except bones and trash. And we're going to talk more specifically about that later on. Um, the red, they're called red because they are actually red. They have a red color to them. And these Worms produce a large amount of organic waste. They produce it quickly. And in the con confined areas of a worm bin, which your outdoor earthworms will not do, and they re re reproduce quickly. Um, as you can see, eight worms can produce up to 1,500 babies in six months. So if you start with a little couple worms, in a matter of a few months, you're going to have a ton of worms. So let's think about this for a second. 2,000 worms, that's a lot of worms, is approximately two pounds. So these 2,000 th 2, worms can process uh, seven pounds of kitchen waste per week. That's like a pound a day. So you have to kind of base it on the amount of, of waste that you have, how much you need. Um, so if you generate only a half a pound of waste each day, then a pound of worms is going to be more than sufficient for you. Um, a little bit about their environment. Um, now, when I was practicing, this did not jump through slides like this. I am so sorry. Um, I hope you guys can just kind of follow along and ask questions. Um, okay, they can tolerate a wide range of temperature, but they produce best in temperatures between 55 and 77. And since the worms breathe through their skin 
and are approximately 70 to 90% moisture, they need a very moist environment. So the bedding should be about 75% moisture. So it's got to be very, very damp, but you have to make sure that there are no puddles that accumulate in the bottom of your bin because they will drown. They do breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, just like humans do. So they also need a well-ventilated bin that allows for good air circulation. And they also like a neutral pH, which is seven. But as you can see, they can tolerate, just like temperature, they can tolerate a pretty wide range of um, pH. The size of your bin is gonna depend on how much food waste, you, food waste you have to put in it. The rule of thumb is that you have roughly one square foot of surface area for each pound of food that you produce each week. So for example, if you've got seven pounds of food waste per week, that's gonna require approximately seven square feet of surface area. So the bin should be approximately two feet by three and a half feet. So what I would suggest is that for a week or two before you actually start your bin, that you accumulate all of your waste and see how much you actually have. And that will tell you what size you need to make it, how many worms you're gonna need. Um, you, know, you also have the option of, of putting less food in and working up to that until you get enough worms to do that. Um, and your actual worm bin should only be about eight to 18 inches deep. When we do the class, we recommend using, if you're just starting a 10 to 14 gallon storage tote that has a tight fitting lid, just, lid, just like you see in the picture here. Um, you can use wood, you can use plastic, but these are easy and cheap to get. Um, so you just work, use whatever works best for you. If you get started, you know, cause you think 10 to 14 gallon is not a really big bin. Um, you can always add a second bin, you can get a larger one and make a bigger bin when you really get into this, but you need to, you need to get started. Um, and the bedding ratio should be three to one material to water by weight. And remember that a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So you should have three times as much water as you do bedding. The bedding, is, is usually newspaper. We always recommend newspaper, but the black and white section, no colored sections. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the big piece of paper and you're gonna rip it in quarters and then take each of those quarter strips and just rip strips. You can use some shredded material, shredded paper, but we don't recommend using a lot because it is so small. When it gets wet, it turns to mush. And then you, you, it clumps just like if you think about yard waste. It, um, you think about yard waste, the grass clumps together and that's when it goes anaerobic and starts to smell. So you'll have the same thing with this, with this mush. Um, you, I would recommend throwing in a couple handfuls of soil. This adds a little bit of grit to your mix as well as some microorganisms that are gonna help with the decomposition. You can keep your bin in the basement, in a garage if it's attached, or if it's in the garage in the spring and summer, move it in for fall and winter. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I actually know one worm composter that kept it under his bed. Um, and then there was another one who had all had a very nice bin and he kept it in his dining room. So, um, I'll go back again. Um, basically, you know, maybe I'll do that at the end. Just remind me at the end and I can give you a quick description on how to actually make a real simple bin. I was gonna do that now, but let's, let's get through this and then I will, um, I will talk about that. Again, the ratio of worms to food is two to one. Two pounds of worms to one pound of food per week. And you can adjust them out, like I mentioned, based on the amount of worms that you have in the bin. If you've got more or less, then you can do more or less. Worms like a varied diet and will eat almost anything. Large pieces need to be cut up or torn into smaller pieces so that there's more surface area. Just like with yard waste composting, if you, um, 
uh, if you give them more surface area to feed on, they will get at it and decompose it a lot faster. Uh, um, it also, making the sizes, the, the pieces smaller also reduces the chance that it's gonna get moldy before the worms have a chance to eat it all. Uh, be especially careful when adding fruit, they can attract fruit flies. And again, no greasy food, no meat, bones, or fat, no dairy products, and no non-food. I mean, they show rubber bands and plastic here, but I'm thinking more of like fast food wrappers, you know, they're paper, you think, oh, I can dump those in, but they have a coating on them, and you don't want to put that in there. Okay, worms eat half of their weight, weight every day. And if you make it easier for them, they will eat more and they will reproduce faster. So you'll have more worms. Okay, back up, there we go. Um, the food needs to be buried in the bedding material about one inch deep. Maybe for fruit a little bit deeper than that because you do not want to attract fruit flies. Uh, rotate the location each time you add food. For example, you might start, if you've got a rectangle box, you might put the food in the first week in the upper left-hand corner. Then the, then the next day, the upper right-hand corner, then the lower right, then the lower left, sort of clockwise, and then do the center and then start over again. You don't want to put the food in the same place every time. So um, uh, at high food times, like at holidays or birthdays, when you have a lot of food or a lot of people, uh, you might want to actually have a separate container and you can take half of your worm bin and move it, move it into this new bin and then add it that way. Or another suggestion is just take that, that extra food, put it in a container and put it in the refrigerator or put it in the freezer because there's going to be times when you're not around that you're going to have much less food waste. And then you can pull this out of the refrigerator or freezer and use it. And again, make sure it's in small pieces. Um, also, you might want to, um, if it's softer, they can, they can digest it faster. So, um, and again, another story, I had one composter, composter who actually had a dedicated blender and for his worm so that he could slightly pulverize the food scrap before putting it in the bin. I don't recommend that, but it is an option. Um, in three to six months, you should have compost available to harvest. Um, and also the worms are gonna need some fresh bedding at that point. So um, you can uh, start watching for that. And as you start seeing more worms and bedding, that's a good indication. It's time to start, start thinking about that. There are a couple of options for, um, for harvesting your compost. One is to um, divide and dump. And what that means is you're gonna take all of the, the bedding material and everything and slide it to one side, one half of the bin. Then on the empty side, you're gonna add new bedding and, and food, and then just wait. Give it a few days, the worms will migrate over into the new bedding and the new food, and then you can pull out the old stuff. Now, if you don't wanna lose your worms, the few that are left in there, then another option would be to dump and spread. So what you do is you take a tarp or a plastic sheet, you dump all of it outside on the ground in the sun into a pile. The worms will migrate down into the bottom center of the pile and then you pull off the compost at the top and the sides and you keep working your way in until you just have the worms left. Then you have new bedding, you put the worms in and um, away you go. Another thing that you can do if you don't wanna wait for the worms to do the work is you can dump them out and actually put on a pair of gloves and start pulling the worms out and putting them back into the new bin with the fresh bedding. Um, and last, if you just have too many worms, you can just take half of the worms, the bedding and everything and take it and put it out in your, um, in your garden and then just start with the worms that you have there. Oh, one more thing, it's not on here, but um, fruit flies, let's talk about that. If you have a lot of fruit waste, you could attract fruit flies. So you use the same technique in your bin that you would use in your house. You'll take a jar and um, put in like a half a cup of juice or, or 
beer or whatever, and then you put in, uh, cover it with, um, with plastic wrap and then push it down so it makes a V, put a teeny hole in the bottom of that V, and then um, put a plastic uh, rubber band around it to hold it, and then set it in your bin. Set it in your bin and the fruit flies will go in just like they would if they, this was on your counter and they can't get out and you'll get rid of the fruit flies that way. No. Um, okay, what, what you can do, how, how you can use your compost. You can mulch it either in your, your house plants or out in your garden. Put it in a, a one inch layer in the soil around these plants. Um, you can actually mix it into your soil to help with, with, the, with the structure and texture of it. Um, again, you can use it for house plants. Um, you can use it for house plants. And remember that compost holds moisture. So it will keep the, keep the roots moist. And so you'll have to water less. It won't burn the roots when you when it added. And another possibility is you can make compost tea. And how you do that is you get a big jar, fill it with water, put your, your compost in there and leave it, just leave it sit for a few days. The nutrients will leach out into the water and then you can, um, and then you can use that water to do your plants. Or you can take the compost, put it in a uh, coffee filter, tie it up and put the coffee filter in the water. And again, after it leaches out, you can, um, you can use it that way. Okay, some of the problems. You don't have enough food, they're gonna, the worms will have to compete for it and they will, a lot of them will die. Um, if it's too dry or too wet, obviously we talked about that, too wet, they can drown, too dry, they will dry up. Um, if there's too high a temperature, again, remember that they are uh, 70 to 90% moisture. And if it gets too hot, they will get dry, the bedding will dry out, they will dry out. Um, and if you don't harvest it on a regular basis and provide them with new bedding, that's going to be a problem for them. Okay, as I said, you should not have odors from your bin, but if you do, here's a couple of things to think about. You might need more air circulation so that you can leave the top off for a little while and that. You could also carefully stir up the bedding in the bin to incorporate some air into the bin. Use gloved hands, not a turning fork because you could stab them. Um, also check to see what food has been eaten in the bin. If the pieces were too big or something that should not go in there, got in there, um, taking that out and stirring up the bedding can help reduce the odors. Okay, there's lots of information on, on composting. This book is kind of like the Bible of worm composting. It's called, you can see it, Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applehoff. And you can get this at libraries, bookstores, or online, whatever. Um, so compost happens. Questions? If you'd like, I can give you a quick, quick, uh, directions on how to how to actually make a real simple worm bin. Um, otherwise, if you've got questions, I'd be happy to take them. I know this was brief, but she said 15 minutes. <laughs> we usually spend three hours on this. <laughs> oh, well, I, I take that back. We spend about two hours on it, and then we spend an hour actually making a bin in, in the class. Yeah, Questions? I'd love to hear Comment? your uh, quick explanation on how to make a worm bin. I'd be very interested in okay. that. Okay, okay, sounds good. What what we do is we, we ask them to bring a 10 to 14 gallon storage tote with a lid, and then that you'll need either two one inch pieces of PVC pipe, which are cut about four inches longer than the length of the bin, or you can use one two inch piece of PVC, PVC pipe, all right? So then what you wanna do is you wanna mark, set it on there, mark the ends, where the, you know, where the bin is at the edge of the pipe, you know? So here and there, you wanna mark that because what you wanna do then is take your drill with the smallest drill bit and drill holes inside those marks. 
So your the, these little tiny holes that you're putting in are stay inside the bin. All right, you're gonna put tiny little holes in there. And then the next thing you're gonna do is depending on whether you have two small pipes or one larger one, you're gonna cut holes in the bin on either end, long end, slide just big enough for the pipes to fit through. Slide it through and then caulk those ends so that the um, so that there's there's no way that the worms can get out through there. All right. So now you've got the bin, you've got one or two pipes going through about three or four inches from the bottom. You want your holes, you want your, your thing. Because what this is going to do is this is going to put keep air in your system. Okay. Remember, I said it needs a lot of air. And then on the ends of your pipes, you're going to take a piece of, um, of screening, put it over it, and then clamp it on. You can use rubber bands, you can use a clamp, you can use um, plastic uh, zip ties, whatever, just so long that it's as long as is tight. Again, you want the air to get in, but you do not want the worms to get out. <laughs> and they can, when they're really tiny, they can crawl in those little tiny holes that you put in there for air inside there. So you want to make sure that they can't go any further. All right. And basically, that's it. Then you put in your, your bedding, you add water, you mix it up, make sure there are no puddles in the bottom, add your worms, stir them up, add food, and you're ready to go. It's, it's really simple, really simple. So, any other questions? I know something that a lot of people I talk to are trepidatious about is getting bugs in their worm bin other than fruit flies, something that maybe came in with any soil they added or if they put like dry leaves in. Um, do you find that that's a common problem that people have? Actually, it's not a problem because remember I said add one or two handfuls of dirt to add microorganisms because those microorganisms, just as in your, your backyard composting pile, they're the microorganisms that help break down the food waste into, into, into your compost. So you want some of those in there. I mean, you don't want a ton of them, but excuse me, you do, you do want them there. So no spiders or anything like that's going to get in? No, not really. And if you've got a, they're not going to get in through the holes because of the screen and they're not going to get in through the top because the top is snapped on tight. So. No spiders. So have you have you heard of these continuous uh, continuous flow systems? Or do you have any any thoughts about those like um, those kinds instead of just like the bin where you have to replace everything every once in a while, like ones where you just keep adding and then pulling from the bottom? You know, I have not heard much about those. I normally don't do this presentation. I have I we have another another master composter that does it. I just do the the like this. Um, I can see how that could work, but at the same time, how is that, how is that continuous airflow happening? Mm. You know? Right. I mean, if it's actually something that that's blowing air in, that would worry me because I would think it would get too dry. Mm. You know, you'd have to be watching, you'd have to be watching your moisture content all the time. That's what would worry me about that. But I, I, I really don't know enough about those to be able to say yes they're good or no they're not that's just the top of my head that's the first thing i thought of when you said you know a constant airflow i thought okay yeah, that Harry. means that yeah you're going to have a lot of yeah yeah i think i think austin was asking about a system where the compost is moved continuously from one side to the other and then you continuously take compost out and add food and i don't think he's talking about continuous airflow ah okay all right i'm sorry misunderstood yeah, sorry, um, I wasn't very clear. No, yeah, that, that makes sense. No, that's fine. Um, actually, yeah, you you do need to do that, but I I really, you know, yes, worms eat eat um, you know half their weight, but their weight isn't very much. So I mean, it's going to take a while, and it just depends on how much work you want to put into this. What I say when I'm doing the bank backyard composting is, don't create a system that's going to be a nuisance to you or work for you because the minute it starts becoming a chore, you're going to stop doing it. That's it. So you want it easy. And, and the, the, the way we, the, the kind of the way we encourage people to start is we want to make it easy for them. And as they see 
what a great system it is and, and, and how much it can, it can reduce the, their waste, then they will expand it and they'll try other things. But that's just, that's just me talking and, and knowing human nature after all these years that if it becomes, if it becomes a chore, it'll get, it'll get dropped. You know, it, it won't happen. So I would just make it as easy as possible. And, and they do it on their own. You know, they don't need a lot of help from you. They just need you to give it food and every three to six months, change out the, the bedding for them and farvest the compost. That's it. That's all they need from you. <laughs> Anything else? Are there well, any other resources besides the book that would be like trustworthy um, resources? You can just go. You can just go online and Google worm composting or vermicomposting. You'll get more information probably than you can read in a in your lifetime. <laughs> and if you do have other questions um, or or want want some more explanation on on because I know I went very quickly how to do this bin and if you're not really good with you know visuals in your head, then it probably didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, you can email me. There's my email address. I'm working from home as everybody else is for the last year and um, with no end in sight for us. Um, so you can you can just email me and I'd be happy to answer your questions. And if it's a question I can't answer, I will forward it to our, our, our worm lady. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I think the only other question I had was um, if the worms reproduce so quickly, then how is it that you don't have like a bin overflowing with worms at the end of six months or something? Well, you know, you could have, you could have, if you're, if you give them great food that they can, that they can eat quickly, you could. And that's, that's another indication of when it's time to start to, to harvest and change is when you're seeing more worms than bedding, you know, it's time to, to to re, to create a new a new bin for them, and and like I said, you've got several options. You can give worms away. You can put them in your garden. You can start a second bin. But yeah, that's a good indication. And as you watch it, you're going to see. Okay, I'm seeing these worms. I'm seeing a lot of these little babies. I you know, so I can, you'll see what's going on, and you'll be able to um, you know. Trial and error, you'll get it. They're they're pretty, as long as you give them a moist air environment, you can't do too much damage to them. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Can you put the worms right in a raised bed? You mean, uh, you mean like outside? Yeah. When you're, you know, like if you're gonna just take half of them and put them out there, yeah, you just put them out, spread them. Mound, they'll they'll burrow into the into the into the into the ground and create aeration in in the ground for you so yeah and then the 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 compost that's left on the surface will will continue to decompose the um the nutrients in that compost will again leach into the soil around your plants yeah that's easy Anything else? Okay, then. Like I said, if you have any questions or, or anything, let me know. I'd be happy to answer them for you. You can get, I'm, I'm available pretty much all day, every day at, by email. Awesome, well, thank thanks you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yes. thanks for coming up. Thank you. All right. So I should, oh, I don't even need to do that. Let me see. Uh, so we do have a lot of great events going on. And let me find it. There we go. 
So we have a lot of great events coming up. Like I said, we do live better, wonder more and help often. So we interact with a lot of other people in communities and we always try to better ourselves. So uh, we have grandmother fish story time. We always have lots of committee meetings, lots and lots. So if you like meetings, this is the place for you. Yeah, CJ and Austin love that, don't they? <laughs> um, and of course we are doing the online wine with Ted. So we have book clubs, um, we have game nights, and we have recently started a band. So if you would like to participate in that, if you are a musical person, uh, we would love to get you involved. Cuisine Conversation is still temporarily on hold because we really haven't figured out a way to do that online, but we'll get back to that hopefully sometime by the end of summer and lots of other groups. So please just uh, go over to the Sunday Assembly meetup page or Facebook um, or just directly to the website, sundayassemblydetroit.org. And of course, all these things do cost money. So we are a legitimate 503C. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Nobody here makes any money. Nobody takes a dime. We invest everything in our programs. So donations are always wonderful. Uh, the kind of jingle are nice, but the kind of cringle are a lot better. Please no Bitcoins. And life will happen. So we talked about uh, stuff that uh, happened this past month to us and some good stuff. And it's always good to plan for the future. So I plan, I, you know, this winter I've been doing a lot of home renovation stuff. And now that the weather is getting nicer, I'm going to be doing some outdoor stuff. So I will be painting uh, my front and back decks pretty soon and uh, brighten up the neighborhood. And I'll open it up to see if anybody else would like to talk about things that they have planned for uh, the near future. Austin and I were just talking about this yesterday, but I, we're both starting our gardens soon. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm sure I mentioned my tomatoes last year. Anyway, last year was my first year trying to do any sort of food gardening um, or any gardening really. I was always like, now nah, kill plants. And I was able to successfully grow 12 tomato plants in Home Depot five gallon buckets. Um, and that really gave me way too much confidence probably. So now I have a very large garden uh, that I have planned for my backyard. I put my compost last year because I composted outdoors on top of it. Um, so hopefully that soil is nice and ready for some seeds soon. If you have any questions, please always ask me on your garden. Cool, we've got um, coming up um, next weekend is Ostara, and we'll be planting seeds in indoor uh, starter, uh, little starter pots, and then we move those into the ground on Beltane when we celebrate Beltane on May 1st. Don't say dinosaurs. May 1st. Ooh. Yeah, that's too early for me. I was going to say, I think that's, that, I, was, I, was, I wasn't going to do it that early, but. Frost, too much frost. Cause I was hearing like the last frost date was uh, like the seventh or something like that around here. But I guess it's like a week, you know, it's not, not, not that big a difference, but it's interesting. And then of course, everyone can join us for uh, story time in like three minutes uh, as John reads Grandmother Fish. So I think it's a separate Zoom thing, which I think will change that in the future. So it's just the same one people can just well, stay we're in. We're gonna have people hang out and chat after. Oh, are we doing that too? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Well, then I guess we did it as a separate thing so that the kids could do one thing and people could stay here and chat. So I'm going to jump over to John's thing. But if you'd like to sit here and uh, talk with people, go ahead. That's pretty much it. <laughs> All right. So that's everybody's life will happen. Okay. So we have our next assembly is going to be on April 11th. Um, hopefully you join us then and a lot of wonderful online stuff between then. So like Austin said, we can uh, hang out and talk. I'm going to play one more song. You can participate in the song and check out or sneak out during the song or hang out afterwards. It's completely up to you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>